It's wonderful to be back with you today. Connie and I pray for you faithfully, and we observe what God is doing in this congregation. Every time I come back, I see new faces, and that's a good thing. That means that you're reaching people for Jesus Christ, and the church is continuing to be faithful to the gospel. It's wonderful to be here, and Connie joins me in saying how good it is to fellowship and worship with you. I don't know where Connie is today. She's here somewhere. (laughs) Wave at me, dear. There she is, right down there. Anna's here, and James Faulkner is here from uh, Kentucky. I don't have time to go into all that James is involved in here in inner city mission this summer, but we're glad that uh, all of them are sharing in this service today. When Pastor John asked me to preach from the book of Ecclesiastes, I had no idea how relevant the theme that he had chosen for me would be. But just two weeks ago, I was shocked to hear the news that the son of a friend of mine had committed suicide. He was in his early 20s. He was bright. He was talented. He was part of a lovely family. But he left a note for his family saying that he just couldn't go on, that life was not worth living. Of course, you've seen the same sad statistics that I have seen just a couple of weeks ago at the very same time I was getting this news. Our daily Oklahoma newspaper reported that Oklahoma has had one of the highest suicide rate increases in the nation among young people ages 10 to 24. The CDC has found that the suicide rate in Oklahoma has increased by 70% over the last 14 years. What the newspaper was describing was an epidemic of anxiety and depression among young people. One counselor said kids are having trouble finding a reason to get out of bed. They're seriously wondering if life is worth living. That's my topic topic for today. It's the question, is life worth living? A key word in the book of Ecclesiastes, as you know, is the word vanity or emptiness or meaninglessness as a description of life. It means emptiness or futility. It refers to that which cannot satisfy. It's the Hebrew word habel or Abel. When Eve gave a name to her son, she named him Abel or Habel. He died prematurely. The writer of Ecclesiastes tell us in verse 2 through chap- from chapter 9, it says, All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. The same destiny overtakes all, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. We're left with the impression that apart from further revelation on the subject, that death is final and that life is empty, life is meaningless, life is vain, life has no value. Is life worth living? Well, somebody might say, I'm not so sure. We have a hard time with this. We can't handle the magnitude of the subject of death. When I reached out to my friend to try to find words of consolation, I struggled to find language to convey my thoughts. I finally told him, there are no words. And I could see by the anguish in his face that I was right. His anguish was overwhelming. There was nothing I could say except to say, I am so sorry. I am praying for you. Is life worth living? Ecclesiastes oscillates between two points of view. Some people answer, no, life is a trial. It's a labor with little profit. But others say, yes, life is a gift from God, and it is to be enjoyed. It's to be lived to the fullest. The writer whom tradition tells us was King Solomon sees both sides and expresses both sentiments. He's realistic. Life is both a blessing and a trial. The same baby that brings you so much joy can grow up to break your heart. In view of that, people live one of two ways. One way is a worldview confined to the experience of humanity without God, described as folly. The other worldview says we were created for a purpose, and life is worth living. It's life with God. This is the way of wisdom. The former worldview says get all the pleasure you can get out of life now because death is, is the end and there is nothingness beyond that. It's extinction. But the latter worldview says, enjoy the blessings of life now, but know that under the sun, life here cannot give you what only God can give, and that's meaning and purpose and value and eternal life. The passage before us today 
from chapter 9 through chapter 11, the first part of chapter 11, develops this theme. The same fates, meaninglessness, and then death await both the wise and the foolish, Solomon says. And if that makes you uncomfortable, I need to remind you that this book was inspired by God and it belongs in the Bible. Listen to the words of Ecclesiastes 12, 11. The words of the wise are like goads. Their collected sayings are like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. That one shepherd is the good shepherd, the Lord God himself who inspired the writing of this book, and he intends it to be in the collected writings that we know as the Bible. So first, we notice the way things are. Life on earth is full of uncertainty and injustice. Chapter 9, verse 11. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Here's an elegant little poem which raises the question, how can we believe that life is worth living if everything seems subject to time and chance? Now, the writer doesn't answer the question. He wants us to think about it. He wants us to let it marinate, meditate on this. Life looks, from all appearances, to be vain and empty and meaningless. The swift, the strong, the wise, the brilliant, the learned, they're the children of privilege. They are the ones who have all the advantages. But in the final analysis, they are subject to the same time and chance that happened to the rest of us mere mortals. What does Solomon mean by time and chance? Well, he's referring to the unexpected circumstances and events that catch us by surprise and upend our lives. The unpredictable, the unexpected things that hinder us and hold us back and disappoint us. That's life under the sun. So we have to ask, is there an unseen hand of providence influencing these circumstances and their outcomes? Well, Solomon is going to get to the subject of providence, but not just yet. For now, we're left to contemplate the meaning of such tragic events as the collapse of the Champlain Towers in Sunrise, Florida, or the latest mass shooting, or a young man's suicide. Time and chance happen to them all. Ecclesiastes raises the questions but it doesn't provide complete answers. The poem is followed by a proverb in verse 12. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come as fish are caught in a cruel net or birds taken in a snare. So men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. No one knows when their hour will come. The hour when disaster strikes. Time and chance are unpredictable. It goes without saying that if Kobe Bryant could have known ahead of time what would happen if he had gotten on that, air, that helicopter with his daughter, he never would have gotten aboard. We know that. But the events of life are sometimes like traps that make us feel ensnared by evil times. Like the 20-something son of a pastor friend of mine in Ohio who last year lay in the hospital ICU for 10 weeks fighting for his life with COVID-19. Thankfully, the Lord spared him. Time and chance are unavoidable. Now, the poem and the proverb are followed by a parable, which further illustrates the uncertainty and injustice of life under the sun. Verse 13, I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The figure of speech that is repeated throughout the book, Under the Sun, has to do with the limits of life on earth. In this imperfect world, things go wrong all the time. And in this little parable... The little man's wisdom saved the town, but his efforts were unrewarded. No one expressed appreciation. There was no parade. There was no citation. There was no medal given to him, no appointment to a position in city government. He was forgotten. The town ignored him and moved on. 
We're approaching the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on our nation. I read in news reports after those events that one of the terrorists who flew the passenger jet into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. had taken flying lessons at an aviation school in Arizona. And the manager of that aviation school had three times reported him as a suspicious character to the FAA and nothing was done. Her wise warnings could have saved many lives, but her cautionary words went unheeded with disastrous results. This reminds me of the Chinese doctor who first reported on the emergence of the coronavirus in late 2019. Instead of being heeded and honored, his warnings were suppressed, and he was reprimanded for disrupting public order. And he later died of the virus in the hospital in Wuhan, China, where he had worked. Verse 17 says, The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than shouts of rulers of fools. Things don't always turn out this badly. But these examples show us how life can be in this imperfect world. Life under the sun has both sorrows and blessings for both believers and unbelievers. Now, why is this true? Well, Solomon hints at an answer in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. There it says, God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. The book of Romans further explains this. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, Romans 5.12. This is the great tragedy of the fall of humanity. We all sinned in Adam, the head of the human race, when he and Eve schemed to disobey the Creator. And we all inherit the tendency to sin from Adam. The result is that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. I'm so glad that verse doesn't end there. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Solomon goes further. He says that life consists of, secondly, frustration and futility. As chapter 10 unfolds, we read that Ecclesiastes is not just historical narrative or Christian theology. Ecclesiastes is not apocalyptic prophecy, but Ecclesiastes is wisdom literature, a genre or a literary Uh, style familiar throughout the ancient Near East. The next section of pithy sayings reminds us of the book of Proverbs, and I want you to let your eyes scan through these verses as I make a few brief comments on chapter 10. It's just a collection of observations about the way of the world, a fallen world as it is, not as the world we would wish it to be. It's a world, uh, an imperfect world, according to Solomon, where the putrid odor of folly overpowers the aroma of wisdom, verses 1 and 2. It is a world where the foolish reveal how stupid they are. They can't find their way home, verse 3. It is a world in which the wrong people get appointed or elected to positions of power. Does that sound familiar? The famous industrial psychologist Lawrence Peter wrote that people in leadership tend to rise to their level of incompetence. (laughs) Maybe he got his theories from Ecclesiastes. Verses 8 through 10 may be summarized as sanctified common sense. If you dig a pit, don't fall into it. If you tear down a wall, watch out for snakes. If you quarry stones, be careful how you carry them because life is full of risks. Life is uncertain. He's being very realistic and transparent here. Verse 11 says that Ecclesiastes, the writer, knew something about snake charmers. I'm not going to go into that. But we know from Psalm 58... Verse 5, that the Lord will not hear the prayer of a charmer or an enchanter. And it gets worse. The first part of the chapter is about the daily lives of ordinary people. Then the writer delves into the realm of politics. He sees wisdom and folly contrasted in high places too. The same frustration and futility reign there among the rich and the powerful. Look at verse 16. Chapter 10, verse 16. Woe to you, O land, where the king was a servant and whose princes feast in the morning. This is a political comment about a ruler who grew old, but he never grew up. Now, the word servant there or slave could be translated child. And in the better translations, I believe that that should be uh, recognized as the preferred translation. Slave and child are based on the same Hebrew root, root word. This is folly on a grand scale. This ruler rules like an inexperienced, emotionally immature, petulant crybaby. 
He whines like a child if he can't get what he wants. He rules by appointing incompetent deputies who use their positions for personal pleasure. Early in the day, they start their feasting and drinking, and the assumption is that this will continue all day. Now, if this assessment of life seems dark and pessimistic, it's because the writer is observing life under the sun, which apart from God appears meaningless, a chasing after wind. It is a world in which even the pursuit of wisdom brings sorrow, and the same fate death awaits both the wise and the foolish. Chapter 2, verse 14. Are we left here, or does the writer give us another perspective? It seems that he points us toward a resolution to the dilemma of life under the sun, because I see the mood changing in chapter 11. He directs our attention to a higher view. Yes, there are many days of darkness, he says in verses 7 and 8, but he seems to be saying, lift your eyes to the light where we experience creation and contentment. There's a different tone here in chapter 11. In the earlier chapters of Ecclesiastes, we were reminded that in an instant, time and chance can disrupt our plans. But here we are taught not to let that fact tempt us to withdraw from life or to be excessively cautious and tentative. Instead, we're encouraged to embrace life as a gift from God. You will remember that this is not the first time Solomon has said this. In Ecclesiastes 8.15, he said, So I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of life God has given them under the sun. I think we can have joy if we'll do two things. First, reverence God. And secondly, embrace life. Reverence God and embrace life. Now, we can have a proper reverence for God if we recognize his power and his providence. When we see the forces of nature, verses 3 and 4, the wind, the clouds, and the rain, we can remember that God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by what has been created, Romans 1.20. Creation, creation itself prompts us to reverence God, to praise him for his almighty power. When we see the miracle of conception, birth, and new life in verse 5, we're awestruck every time. The birth of a baby inspires us to reverence the God who created life. I have no doubt that the two words that are most often uttered in delivery rooms are spoken with prayerful amazement. Oh, God. Amazement at the mystery and miracle of conception, birth, and new life. And then when we observe the cycles of nature in verse 6 and the abundant harvests that follow, we're prompted to reverence the powerful God who created the natural order. Then we can more fully embrace the life for which we were created. Now to reverence God is to praise God. It's to worship God, to honor God, to thank God, to acknowledge His existence, and to recite His attributes. The miracle of life, the majesty of creation, Remind us to reverence God. Verse 5, as you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. We're encouraged to reverence God. We're also encouraged to embrace life. Verses 1 and 2 are interesting. Look with me at chapter 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. Give portions to seven, yes to eight, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. They have been interpreted as advising generous giving, and that may be an appropriate application, but I want to suggest another possibility. I believe the writer here is describing seafaring merchants sending their grain across the waters to other lands to be traded for other commodities. The latest edition of the NIV translation says, ship your grain across the sea, and after many days you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. It's describing commerce and business and trade and the mercantile industries. As a seafaring merchant sends his grain across the waters to other lands to be traded for other commodities, remember that Solomon's ships engaged in trade all over the known world, 1 Kings 10, 22. 
So maybe the advice here is for us not to be so risk averse, but to engage in commerce. Diversify your investments, verse 2. Plan wisely. Make the most of the life you have now. In other words, embrace life. Common sense. Verse 4 tells the farmer not to wait for perfect conditions. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. If he hesitates, he'll never get anything done. No, he can't predict the weather, but he should go ahead and plant and expect a harvest. And the lesson for us is make the most of the life you have now and embrace life. Verse 5 invites us to take a long look at the mystery and miracle of life. Yes, life is uncertain. And yes, it's unpredictable. And yes, it's fraught with disappointments. But remember, after all, that life originates with God. And he means for you to make the most of the life you have now. So embrace life. And verse 6 says to accept responsibility. Sow your seed in the morning and in the evening. Let not your hands be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. Take action. Do the work God has given you to do. There's potential for good results. Make the most of the life you have now. Embrace life. Adventure writer Phil Edwards was quoted as saying, and I quote, there is a need in all of us for controlled danger. There's a need for activity that puts us on the edge of life. There are uncounted millions of people right now who are going through life without any sort of real vibrant kick. I call them the legions of the unjazzed, end quote. <laughs> Phil Edwards was not a philosopher or a theologian. He was not a poet or a teacher. You know what he was? He was a world champion surfboard rider. He was talking about surfing. And I think Solomon would agree with him. Life is worth living. We've got to let go of faithless hesitation. There is something God has for us to do in this world. Yes, we're saved to go to heaven, but we're also saved in order to live meaningful and purposeful and active and vibrant lives here on earth to make a contribution to the world we live in and to help others and to serve others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must reverence God and embrace the life he has given us because life is short. That's one of the themes of Ecclesiastes. Life is temporary. It's like a wisp or a breath of wind and then it is over. Look at verse 7. Light is sweet and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. But let him remember the days of darkness for they will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. My friend whose son died under tragic circumstances is going through a very dark time right now. But whether times are dark or bright, we can remember that God has put eternity in our hearts, Ecclesiastes 3.11. This means he has put the yearning for immortality in every heart. Or in the words of C.S. Lewis, the existence of thirst means there is such a thing as water. But Ecclesiastes doesn't give us a complete statement of life after death. Instead, it launches us into the New Testament where the message of the gospel is that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Life is worth living. Or as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. You are all children of the light and children of the day. Christ did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that we may live together with him. The contrast between light and darkness in verses 7 and 8 is like the difference between life and death. You know, of course, that throughout the Bible, light and darkness are terms that are given a moral and spiritual connotation. They are metaphors for good and evil, revelation and ignorance, truth and falsehood. So in the biblical perspective, verses 7 and 8 point us forward to the completed revelation of the New Testament, to the gospel, which says Jesus Christ died in place of us so that we may live with him. Paul was writing 1 Thessalonians to people like my friend who were grieving, who were in the darkness of grief, grieving the death of loved ones. 
They were concerned about the destiny of those who had died. And Paul said, there is comfort in these words. Now, when someone's grieving, you go to them with hugs. When someone is grieving, you send flowers. And that's good. When someone is grieving, you send cards and you write notes of love and comfort. And that's good. Even casseroles are good when someone is grieving. (laughs) But there's something even better. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Paul says, comfort one another with these words, gospel words. Jesus died for us so that we may live together with him. And he's talking about live with him in eternity, live with him beyond this physical life under the sun, live with him above the sun, live with him in glory. That's what he's talking about. So these verses are written to people who are in the darkness of grief. But Paul said to encourage them with these words, with the words of the gospel, because Jesus endured the darkness of death so that we might enjoy the light of eternal life with him. To receive eternal life, we must place our trust in him alone. Ecclesiastes shows us that the world under the sun can be full of risks and dangers and contradictions. It's not always a friendly place. It reminds us that death is inevitable. But the gospel's good news is that death will not have the last word. Those who believe in Jesus have been rescued out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. And the kingdom of Jesus is the kingdom of light, Colossians 1.13. Is life worth living? Yes, life is worth living. And eternal life is promised to those who trust in Jesus. Derek Kidner said it very well. Ecclesiastes asks the questions. Christ is the answer. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we've been pondering the meaning of life in an imperfect world under the sun. We admit to you that our understanding is limited and sometimes we share the uncertainty and the frustration of our fellow human beings. We confess this to you. Sometimes our faith is weak. But we want to reverence you and we want to praise you for the magnificence of your creation and the mystery of life. Help us to embrace life and to make the best use of the time and opportunities you've given us. Oh, Father, we thank you for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who entered the darkness and defeated death by his resurrection so that we could have eternal life. Thank you that in Christ your people are transferred from darkness to light, from folly to wisdom, from life under the sun to eternal glory. So strengthen our faith in Jesus and help us to live in his light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.